it doesn't make sense for us to have a brand new session, they can watch the, the recording from, from this fall. And maybe the, the TAs who, who didn't have conflicts here today will have an opportunity to see the, the recordings as well. So, um, since this isn't like a uh, straight up lecture, I appreciate you uh, helping run the, run the cameras for, for me. Um, so, uh, let's uh, introduce ourselves because I haven't had everyone in this room as a student myself. Um, so, I am Jonathan Geisler. I am beginning my 20th year as an instructor here at, at Taylor, and my prim primary teaching responsibilities are in the computer engineering side of things. Um, so, I teach classes like operating systems, computer architecture, as well as the freshman and senior uh, beginning and ending classes, um, and last year I started a blockchain course and so forth. So um, those are the types of courses that I teach in our curriculum. Thanks for the thumbs up, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tom Nicola. Um, I've only been here 14 years. Um, I started up kind of as a new systems guy. So I taught like I, ISA and ISD and software engineering and uh, the database course uh, in the early going. Um, and I did that for about 10 years and um, kind of asked my colleagues if I could start doing more nerdy things. Um, so I've kind of moved over to doing um, uh, like the multi-tier web class, uh, revamped version of the database class. Um, I uh, also teach the parallel and distributed computing course, which was my, um, my research area in graduate school. Um, and before I was at Taylor, I worked at a lot of different uh, companies, both small and large, uh, often in the uh, large-scale computing space. Uh, so before I came here, my immediate previous job was building supercomputers for the intelligence community. Um, so a little bit different kind of roles. But uh, I also do stuff with the missions community. So when the, when the department hired me, they were looking for somebody to direct the Center for Missions Computing which it turns out didn't actually exist. So I'm the founding director of that center. And we get students engaged uh, in a lot of different mission-related projects. And uh, you may have heard of our J-term trips to different places around the world, that kind of stuff. So it's been a really fun mix of um, nerdliness and ministry-related things as well. So like I said, this is the first time we've ever done this TAA training before. Um, and this came about as part of our departmental discussions at the end of last year, we were discussing ways that we could improve the program. And one of the things that we thought would be e easier for us to, to make changes in is to try to, to help um, TAs, especially those of you who haven't been a TA before, um, get an idea of what we're hoping from you when you're working with the students. Because um, you get a lot more time with the students one-on-one -on -one than any one of us do, right? Even if we're walking around in the lab, there's one of us, and oftentimes there's two or, or three of you. Um, and so we want to, to try to um, help you become effective, um, or more effective, I know that a lot of you do a really good job of, of teaching, um, at, the, at the role of, of helping each other out. Uh, so that's kind of what kind of initiated uh, the, the topic that, that we're covering today. Um, so, um, you guys are really important to the whole enterprise. Uh, you know, there's a limited number of teachers in the department and across campus. And so, in a real fundamental way, you're sort of extensions of, of the teaching that we're trying to deliver. And um, I think, I, I, I'm a, I apologize, I guess. That I sometimes think of TAs as well. They're just the people who are going to do my grading for me, <laughs> which is true and is awesome. But <laughs> you're much more a part of the actual delivery of content and the mentoring of other students um, than you know than you are just graders. And we want to kind of welcome you into that uh, into that sense of participation with us as communicating a lot of really good and important information to students, and doing it in a way that is arguably maybe more. Um, 
maybe see as more relevant to the students that you're working with, right? Because we're like old farts with a bunch of degrees and all that kind of stuff. And we, we may s seem a little bit more off-putting or harder to relate to or whatever than you guys. Um, and we know you have the skills and you have the knowledge and you have the ability to communicate with other students. And, and that's a super important part of, of us being able to deliver a good computer science education as, as an entire team of both faculty and teaching assistants. So, um, thank you for doing that, and you know, just be aware that we really do think of you as um, an integral part of that process. So, what we thought we would do today is we, uh, we wanted to cover some kind of principles that we want you to be thinking about as you're, you're helping students out. And then we thought we'd maybe play at uh, a, a little example where, where I, I will be the TA and Dr. Nerkula will, will be the I can't say with the the season thing, right? Um, and and then you can critique. Uh, we'll we'll have some stopping points along the way, and you can critique uh, what I did well and what I could have done better in my role as a TA with him. Yes. Uh, how long is this going to be? Probably about an hour. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so. Um, the, the first principle that we, we want you to be thinking of, and maybe you can, I, I read this as I was trying to prepare for, for tonight, is that your role is to remember your role is a teaching assistant, not a grade assistant, right? That the, the primary functionality that you're trying to achieve is trying to help the students that you're interacting with learn the material that they're they're trying to uh, cover in, in the class. It's not to help them get an A or a B or even a C for, for those students who really struggle and really need the help, right? The ultimate goal that you're trying to achieve is to assist them in learning. And especially, uh, I know you've heard this from multiple instructors when you've been in the classes, we want as instructors to help you learn how to learn and so we want you to help these students in that process of learning how to learn okay and so the things that you can do to assist in in that teaching in, endeavor um, are going to be along the lines of more um, what might be like some fancy words, like a, the Socratic method, uh, where, where you're in the role of the question asker, where you're asking a lot of questions. And I know that seems backward because they're raising their hand, and they're wanting to ask you for help. And so to ask a question of someone who asks a question kind of seems a little bit backwards. But if you think even to how Jesus was a teacher, was the, the, was the best teacher. And to think about how he responded to the people who came to him with questions. Oftentimes, that was exactly what he did in response to their question. It was not just to answer their question, but to give a probing question in response to the question that they posed to him. All right? Some of that is just going to be... Um, very straightforward for you to, to ask those questions. Really, because when the, when the student raises their hand and you're coming over, you have to ask questions just to figure out what's going on. What are you working on? What are you stuck on? Right? You, you have to kind of set the, the situation up so that you even have a chance to, to assist them. So those are going to be natural questions that, that you're going to come up with. After this lecture, we're going to print posters, let me turn it off this light real quick, uh, from this resource right here. It's called csteachingtips.org. You can see the, the team of, of people that have worked doing research trying to help develop these tips. And there's all kinds of teaching tips that this group has designed. This one is specifically designed for people in, in the lab room. Um, and you can see that... They, there are a lot of questions that are centered or around your um, trying to figure out how to best help them. What is, what is the problem trying to do? 
What is it supposed to do? Um, and, and so forth. Um, and so you can see there's a lot of questions on, on this document. We're not going to go through each question individually here. But we want you to be kind of thinking in terms of, of this kind of dialogue with them. Um, so, so that you can come up to them and, and try to help them land on what the problem is and a way of proceeding to try to solve the problem that they feel like they can't overcome and that they need your help for. Okay, so I want you to kind of uh, be, be thinking uh, about that in that term. The other fancy word that we talked about was uh, autodidactic, autodidactic um, which is what we're trying to develop in all of you. Auto means self, didactic is learning. We're trying to develop people who are, are self-learners. Right? And um, I don't know about you, but at the end of a long day when I've been helping a lot of students, my temptation is like, I just need to be done. <laughs> Right? And my temptation is like, okay, I'll just, here's the answer. Put a semicolon here, do I plus three, and you're going to be so much happier, right? <clears throat> but that's not really helping them, really. It's, it looks like in the moment that it's helping them, right? It gets them past whatever their short-term stumbling block is. But they haven't learned what the problem was. They haven't learned why that needs to be done the way that that is. Um, and so the next time they encounter that same kind of error, that same kind of, of, of problem, they're going to be just as stuck the second time around as they were the first time around because they haven't learned what the problem is. They haven't learned how to solve that problem. And, and so the, they, they're in the same spot in their learning process as they were before uh, I gave them that, that quick answer. This is really at the heart of this distinction that Dr. Ghost is drawing between being a teaching assistant and being a grade assistant, right? Um, you, you want to empower the people you're working with to be able to solve these problems themselves. And you know, what he suggested about kind of this is the Socratic method, right? More focused on asking questions. If you go back and read, well, Socrates didn't write anything down, but if you go back and read, some, uh, read, read Plato, there's this one, one theme in the writing there is actually that teaching. I don't know that this is a legitimate you know, cognitive science conclusion that we would make in the 21st century, but the teaching was really getting the learner to discover things he or she already knew. Uh, I don't think that's really a legitimate cognitive model, but it kind of highlights that idea of you're sort of leading that person through the process of, of discovering something on their own, or leaving them a, a lot of room to go through that process kind of in your presence, and you're, you're by, by asking good questions like these, um, you're helping them do that. Um, one of the, uh, if you remember, well, if, you, if you've interacted with Dr. Bramble or you remember your freshman orientation, he always trots out the little rubber ducky, right? The, the rubber ducky debugging tool, where you just explain to the duck, here's the problem I have. And oftentimes, you'll discover that you'll solve the problem because you just had to take the time to sort of sit through and think about it systematically in order to explain it to the duck. Um, and we see that all the time, right? Where a student comes in, I have a question about this homework question, and you ask a few questions, you know, like these, to get them to sort of engage in that process of thinking through the answers to that question, and they discover it on their own. You know, as if they came with that knowledge, it just was covered up, right, to that platonic model. Um, this is something I also saw a lot um, in industry. I'd have you know, people that were working on my team wander up. I'd be sitting at my, at my desk. Tom, can I ask you a question? Sure, what is it? Well, I'm working on this and this, and I tried this, and then they go, oh, of course that's the problem. And then I don't have to say a thing. They just solve the problem on their own, and they walk away and go, go and do it, right? So we're trying to encourage that kind of, uh, of sort of serendipitous occurrence where the person with the question is an active participant in coming up with the solution. Not just add three and you'll be happy, right? But why are you adding three? And sort of seeing that broader picture and, and using a, a framework of 
questions and answers is a super helpful way to get that to happen. So I thought maybe we, we could try this out with, the, with our, our little skip here. Uh, it's not a, it's not with a, uh, uh, script. Uh, script, and so <laughs> a little, little bit add this here. So, um, well, I was about to say yes. <laughs> so, um, do you need to get set up at, to, to be set? Um, the other thing that, that um, I want to say um, that I've noticed in, in some of my labs is that uh, I would like you as TAs, and I don't know um, how this works for you, some of you do this automatically, I, mean, I haven't observed all of you as a TA, to be proactive. If you're sitting in the back row um, doing your own homework um, during lab, that's not really the appropriate activity for, for you in the, the lab setting. Um, I, in, in my labs, I know Dr. Brandel's labs, I'm, I'm sure in, in Dr. White's lab, um, there's a lot of questions that happen that students are afraid to raise their hand. They don't want to look stupid, right? Even in the smaller classroom, even around, especially around other students, right? So if you're being proactive, if you're walking around the classroom, um, it's amazing how much easier it is for someone to kind of maybe look over their shoulder. <laughs> Um, or right when you're next to them, oh, I've got, you know, the, the, the slight hand raise that happens, that doesn't happen when you're just two rows behind them in the back, looking, even though you're not, looking too busy for, to help them. So I want to encourage you to be proactively walking through the labs, going through each aisle um, as you, you can to make your presence uh, felt so people feel comfortable asking you the questions that they're running into in the moment. If they're not, feel free to ask questions. What's going? What are you doing? Can you show me your progress? How how are things going? Just kind of building up that rapport with with the students, not in an interrogative way. Like, I can't believe your thing's not working yet, but oh, how far along? Are you? Oh, that's great. I'm so that's a, that's neat. Uh, especially. Uh, you know, when some of the labs allow for creativity, so if you think of the COS-120 infection lab that Dr. Brendel does, right, there's part of that is you get to choose how you want to extend it in one, uh, one way. So if you're the TA in that lab, what, what are you going to try to do? How, how are you going to try to extend this lab and kind of building that connection so that they're, they're not afraid to communicate with you because they already know that it's, it's comfortable um, to to talk that 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 you're not some scary upperclassman. Um, it, it, you're never as scary as the scary professor is, fortunately. But but you still are. There's there's a there's a difference be, between you, a perceived difference at least, between you and, and the students that you're trying to help. Um, so I want to encourage you to, to do that. The one one phrase you might have put around that is, is the idea of power distance, right? You have a certain, even as a TA, you're still a student, you're still an undergrad, but you still have some authority over the other students. You know, you're going to do, do some stuff with their rating. You might, you know, be letting the professor know who's struggling, you know, different kinds of things like that, where you just have a little bit of a different role. And it's it's much worse for, well, a much larger distance for the professors, right? And, and we sometimes, you know, don't, we don't do a lot in, in, in certain situations to try to reduce that distance. You know, so you go into a professor's office, and there's all their degrees, right? Or all their awards, or all the papers that they've published, right? And you think, oh my gosh, I'm just like a peon, and there's no way I should really be bothering this dude, right? Um, and, and that's what we're actively trying to work with guests, right? Every time we introduce ourselves to the freshmen, you know, we'll say, where are, we're your least utilized resource on campus, right? And the reason we're here is to help you guys learn. Um, we certainly didn't come for the money or the power, <laughs> at least not to tell it, right? We're here for you guys. And anything you can do to kind of reduce that power distance to make the other students feel comfortable coming and talking to you. And, and often that's just something as simple as stuff you guys are saying, I'm just kind of getting up and wandering around. Students will be more willing to ask you that than if they, if they feel like they're calling you across the room. 
some students, you know, Joey has no problem with that. And that's awesome, right? But we're, we're kind of a, you know, I tend to be an introverted, um, less socially developed kind of personalities. Um, and that, that can be really challenging, right? So, yeah, anything you do to facilitate that, you certainly want to give that a go. All right. <clears throat> so, I'm going to start this then by walking around, because I don't see any students with questions, there's no hands raised, so I'm walking around and stuff. Dr. Giesler? <laughs> hey, Dr. Giesler? <laughs> yes. I'm Tom Nurley, hold on, and I'm in your CSI class, or C, let's see, CSI, CSI Miami, CSI plan. <laughs> awesome, awesome. CSI. So how, how are things going in the class? It's confusing. Uh, okay. It's super hard. And what we're working on right now, I'm really confused about, is this thing called, uh, I think it's cache. A cache. Uh, do you mean, have, have I called it a cache in, in past? Um, no, it's not a finance class. It's okay. Like, what do you <laughs> but I do write with a dollar sign in the number work, too, so that probably means it's confusing. That's true, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe it's actually cache. Okay, okay. So, so we're told, like, we have, like, a 12-bit address. And all I'm trying to do is figure out how many S bits I need to have. And I'm not really sure what S bits are, but you know, if you just give me a hint like for this one problem, like do I need two, do I need three, do I need seven? Yeah, yeah. So what what's confusing about the the S bits? Well, uh, I don't know what they do or what they mean. Okay. Um, can you uh, do you, do you uh, have a place in the textbook that we could uh, look at to try to to try to figure out what the yeah, definition yeah, there's is. This, there's a section about uh, like set associative caches or something like cache caches. Okay. okay. Um, it gets used there, but I'm not really sure what's going on there. Okay, so set associative s maybe those are connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. What is? Uh, do you know what the the word associative means? Uh, it's like you know. Who am I going to go out with this weekend? Okay, okay. Associate with them? Okay, okay. Um, it, does it have any other um, uh, meaning? I, I, I don't really know in, in this ICS, CSI world. Uh, yeah, it's a tough class, I know. Um, so, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's get your book out then, maybe, and try to, to, to find the, the, the definition of it. Okay, so this little picture here has, like, the, these, these sets. Um, where the values are actually going, and but but like there's four sets, but it shows only two bits. And okay. Doesn't, why isn't there four bits for the four sets? Okay, well that's a great question. So is there any mathematical relationship between the values two and four? Well, two plus two more, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Two or plus two, two. Two times two. Two times two. Yep. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, is that is that right? <laughs> No. There's <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably a power or something like that, like two, 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 two times two, 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 two times. times two. Okay. Two times two twice. Two to the two. Two to the two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot of twos we're throwing in. So let's tr let's try a different number as an example, and maybe see if we see a pattern. That okay. So this other one on the next page of the book has eight sets. Okay. And there, so we got to have, do we need to have eight S bits now? Uh, well, let's think about it. Did we, did we have four S bits when we had four no, sets? No, no, we had two. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So, so we already said they're not going to be the same. So two times two get four. That would be four times two to get eight, right? Okay. So four times two gets us eight. So we should have how many set bits then? Well, I guess four. Four. But are there four S bits in this example? No, no, there's only three. There's only three. No, but that's the same. The two to two times two times two. The two to the third gives us eight. Okay, okay. So what's the pattern that you're starting to see between these these two examples? So I guess we want to have two to the number of bits equal the number of sets. Okay. So that then I know which set I need to look in to see if something's actually in the ca cache. Okay, let's try another example and see if that still works. Okay. Uh, what if we had a set that had, uh, we had an example with 16 sets? Right, right. So then we'd have to have 2 to something to equal, so 2 to the 4th would be 16. So we need 4 set bits. Right. Right. All right, let's pause there.
right. Okay. <laughs> so, so we've talked a ton already today, which is already probably a bad thing. So, help us out. Uh, what, what were some of the things that I did that you thought worked well with Dr. Nerfla? Um, and then we'll talk about well, Nerfla. 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 Yeah. Uh, you redirected his appeal for the answer to a question about what he knew and what he was confused about. Okay. What else? You pointed him to resources he already had, like the book. Okay. Okay. You used the building examples. Okay. You were patient. <laughs> <laughs> that can be hard. <laughs> things do you think I could have done better? Where were some areas of improvement? Yeah. Um, maybe instead of, maybe, depending on the student, instead of like brute forcing like the pattern, um, trying to go more and, and like, like empirically observing what it is, maybe going the route of why is it, or what, what should it be, mm -hmm. and why. Mm -hmm. There's one point that you guys all kind of laughed at. You guys remember? Yeah. When you just flat out said no. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you all well, laugh then? It was too blunt, maybe? No, no it was not too blunt. <laughs> you asked the question. No. Might just lead them down the wrong path if you don't say like, no, that's not right. Yeah. They might be like, oh, maybe I'm onto something. Like, you're not. <laughs> 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 not even close. Oh. See, but even then though, instead of just saying no, you said no, no, that's not right. Like, you still kind of softened it by adding mm -hmm. a few extra words. So it's like, even if the ultimate message is no, that's dumb, you need to say no, that's dumb in a nice way. <laughs> What are some, some other some ways that you can say? Because I think we all know we don't want to actually say no as dumb. Because regardless if it is dumb, unfortunately some of our students will hear no, you're, you're dumb. dumb. Yeah. Right? So another, what are some ways that we can say? Another way you can do it is what well, you did when you got the right answer. Like, okay, let's try this in a different example and see if it still works. Okay. And then it would. Very good. Sometimes in the past when they're like going down a totally wrong path. I remember when I was in their shoes, and I'd be like, oh yeah, like I can see why you're thinking that way, because this and this this, but actually, like actually, mm -hmm. I think that's a good word. Too. That's super helpful, right, is to either have that experience yourself, or have, you know, you've already had three students today ask you this question, and they're misinterpreting that particular thing, or they're, you know, they've got that wrong mental model, um, which is helpful for you as a TA. It's also, incidentally, something that you probably want to bring up with the professor to say, hey, a lot of students are asking this question. There must be something that's missing in how they're learning this to start. So that's, an, that's one really helpful way you can kind of partner with the professor. Um, but having having seen that a few times, right, that's that's really helpful for you as a TA to be able to to, um, to to move the student toward understanding. And you know, we after doing this for years, right, we start seeing those kinds of things where students ask the same kinds of questions, and you know, we. Kind of proactively try to design coursework or homeworks or explanations in homeworks to short circuit those types of things, but you know they still they still come up. So more experience would help. The the idea of putting yourself in their shoes is a really important strategy as, as a TA. A One of the things that uh, that as a, a TA you can suffer from, as a professor we definitely suffer from, is the curse of knowledge. In the, sense, in the sense that we forget what it was like to not know this, right? If, if uh, you were working on a for loop at the beginning of class, right? It's like, I know, I know what a for loop, I don't have to explain what a for loop is anymore, that's just a, a natural thing. And maybe I don't know the exact syntax, but I know what a loop is, right? I don't have to explain to an upperclassman what a loop is. But how much, 
How much of your first semester course is just spent on MOOCs, Dr. Wei? Uh, we spend a lot of time. A lot of time. <laughs> yeah. It takes a long time to get that knowledge into our heads and to figure out what a loop is and why it is the, the way it is. And we forget how much time it took us to go from a, I don't understand this, this doesn't make any sense to me, to, oh yeah, a loop. And that's all you need is that one word. And it brings in this huge um, context of, well, I'm doing things multiple times, there's a begin condition and end condition, there's probably maybe some sort of increment or, or, or something, right? All of that is brought into your head with the one word loop. But it's not brought into our students' heads yet. Um, and so trying to figure out where it is that you have that knowledge and where the student doesn't have that knowledge and how you got from that same position to where you are now is a, is a fantastic way of trying to help that student because if that's how you got there, it might be a path that will work for, for that other student as well. That's, that's something that I'm always trying to remind myself of is the notion of recursive knowledge. Um, so when a student asks a question, you just serve on the fly in class. You, you got to kind of quickly step back and think, okay, from what I know about this student or you know, the class that they're in, the likely classes they've had as prereqs or whatever, how, kind of how far back do I have to reach to make a connection with what they understand and move forward to answer their question in a real way? Uh, it, it's not enough for me to just sort of speak from my experience. I've got to try to guess sort of where they're at. And um, that's another place where this sort of Socratic process is helpful, right? Because as soon as you start having that, having that conversation or uh, answering a question in a certain way, um, you know, you kind of look at the student and, and you get a, a, a little bit of a read back from them about, I have no idea what this guy is talking about. Uh, and then, you know, you got to kind of go back again and, and maybe supplement what you're saying with further background information until you can make that match between what you're trying to get the student to and where they've come so far. Um, and just you know, continue to practice that. But the awareness is really the, the main thing, right? Just keep, keep, keep in mind that that is the case. And like what Dr. Oster was saying about, you know, fall back on your own experience. If, you know, like for some of us, it's been a long time, I don't remember how I learned four loops in the sixth grade in 1972, right? Um, but try to you know tr try to tr try out the path that you took, but you also want to be aware that not everybody is going to reach the same conclusion along the same path, right? So if um, if you're trying to find that point of contact between the student's existing understanding and where you're trying to take them, be aware that there's going to be multiple ways that you might try to do that, right? Let's look at it this way. Let's try to look at it from a slightly different angle, or. Let's try to draw in some other related knowledge that you think they might have already on board that would help them move toward what you're trying to get them to understand. Don't just sort of say, well, you know, I tried explaining it to you the way I learned it, and that didn't work, so I'm going to give up. Right? There's going to be a bunch of different ways that you can try to explain things. Or repeat yourself the exact same thing that you did before, right? Yeah. Because somehow if I repeat it louder or a second or third time. Just do it louder, it really helps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it also works when you're trying to communicate in English in a foreign country where they don't speak English. I want a bus ticket! <laughs> it doesn't look like <laughs> um, So, uh, another thing uh, I want to encourage you to do in addition to a uh, proactive mentality of, of asking questions and, and um, understanding where the work is, I want you to think about your physical posture. Okay? A lot of the times, the students that you're helping um, are going to be sitting down at a desk, right? At the computer in front of them. And so, <coughs> um, in, in an effort, to be more eye to eye with them rather than looking down on them because it can feel like that's not just a physical stance but it can feel like a figurative stance. I want to encourage you to, to figure out how you can do that. Oftentimes when I first go to a student and, and I don't know how long I'm going to be with them, I might kneel like, like this just 
Now my eye level is the same as all of your eye levels, right? Because I'm at that same posture as you. It makes us feel more like an equal rather than me being above you, talking down to you. That can get sore really quickly, and if I learn that this is going to be a long question, you know, I might take a seat, right? And I'm in, I'm still in that same shared posture with with that student. I want to encourage you to. to that's hard in a full lab, right? A lot of the chairs are, are taken, but I want to encourage you to to try to have that kind of a, a physical posture because it communicates, not explicitly, but it it, it com communicates implicitly that you're in this together with, with the student, that you're, you're, sh you're sharing their, their, um, their it helps experience you, with them. It helps with you remember it, right? Now, I've, Esther's my next door neighbor, and I've known her since she was like five years old, so she doesn't take me that seriously, but she's small stature, and I'm kind of a big dude, right? That's just got to be intimidating to be that student, you know, that doesn't know this guy, and, uh, you know, you, you want to break down those barriers wherever possible, and yeah, just sitting down next to them, making it feel more like a friendly exchange of ideas, as opposed to I'm going to impart things into your brain. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, I, I skipped over the very beginning of this uh, slide here, um, because it kind of, I think, feels weird at Taylor. Sure. Um, because uh, this is supposed to be a place where we all know each other, uh, but especially at the beginning of the semester, you haven't met as, uh, all the students that are in, in your class, especially if you're TA for 120, right? This is their first semester here. They're new. Maybe you think you know who they are, but maybe they don't know who you are. Um, so um, it can be scary to ask someone you don't know or help ask her a question. And so if you're proactive and say, hey, um, you know, my name is Jonathan. It's nice to meet you. Um, I'm going to be your TA this semester. Uh, you know, having those, those kind of conversations is going to just make it easy at her as the, the semester progresses because it becomes that kind of relational interaction that we're really trying to emphasize here today, right? It's the intentional community in the lab setting, all right? Um, so this, um, hopefully, when you're talking about upper level classes, you've had some sort of interaction with the student. The but it's not just All right. Um, <coughs> the, um, so, so this kind of mentality we want to do. <clears throat> all, almost all of you have had Dr. White in class. You know that he has the, the specific um, set of problem solving skills that he's trying to, to develop in that class, right? That's one of the big learning objectives of that class. Um, those don't stop after 120, right? They, they, they aren't just skills for his class. They're, they're skills that go beyond his class. Um, so trying to develop those, especially in his lab, I think is important. Asking those questions about how do you draw, you know, what's, what's the picture that helps you solve this problem? You know, can, can you solve a, a specific example before we try to generalize it? All these, the, the five different pr principles, problem solving strategies that, that he, he goes through are things, especially as a 120 TA, that you want to try to help him emphasize in, in the lab. Um, because that's where they're actually going to be putting those principles into, into practice, um, is when they're actually doing the coding and trying to solve the problems. He's trying to demonstrate those principles in front of the class and in all the problems that he's trying to solve in class. But no matter how good of a student we are, we don't fully, really internalize our learning until we actually do the learning that we're doing. So um, help him out and go through those learning uh, problem solving strategies in, in the lab. Talk to the professor, if you're not teaching a 120 lab, but you're doing a 120 lab, with 121 lab with Dr. Randall, or you're doing um, 
a uh, CAS 109 lab with Dr. Stanley or whatever lab it is, see if there are specific principles or learning guidelines that uh, he wants you to help him emphasize during these, these last sessions. Uh, that's that's the, the nature of, of the partnership that we really want to, you guys to, to succeed at well. I think one of the one of the metaphors that I really like um, for doing any kind of technical work, well, for doing any kind of work, um, and certainly in computing, is the notion of building up a collection of sharp tools that you can use to apply to different problems. Uh, if you look at my office door right now, I was talking about this with Esther the other day. Uh, I have a, a, a printout of a photograph of what's called this. It's called the Studly um, Tool Chest, and, and it, it is kind of studly, but that's actually the guy's name was Studley, um, and he was a piano maker, like not just a piano repairman or a piano tuner, but he could like take a pile of wood and a bunch of wire and turn it into a piano. And, uh, and he's got this just amazing toolbox that he's crafted by hand, and it's got you know tons of little cubbies for parts and screwdrivers and you know, the old fashioned kind of uh, bit and brace kind of drills and all sorts of bits and whatnot. It's just a really neat representation of just this guy's complete set of tools that he's acquired over the course of a lifetime of making pianos. And I really think that's one of, the, one of the goals that we have in many classes is to just give students the tools that they need to be able to solve problems. Um, so like the, the five things that, that Dr. White uses in 120 is sort of the beginning of that toolbox, right? And every time we teach, this, teach a student a new idea, a new strategy, a new, a new model, a new metaphor, that's something we're kind of adding to the toolbox. And our job as teachers and TAs is to kind of facilitate that journey, right? To, to give the student another thing that they can trot out when they need it to solve a particular type of problem. And you know, eventually learn to adapt those things and integrate those things. And I'm going to you know, try these two strategies together in a new way. But you know, just giving the basic, the basic toolbox um, is, a, is a, I think, a really worthwhile goal and something that's going to benefit um, benefit to your students for the rest of their careers, certainly, and also will serve as a great example of just the learning process that they're going to embark on for the rest of their time as a computer scientist, right? Because that's just never going to stop. The last thing I want to encourage you to do from a kind of a principle or practice to follow is to be prepared for your lab, to know what problem the, the students are. If you show up to lab and you don't know what the, the lab problems that they're working on, uh, your first maybe 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you're trying to get assimilated with, with the problem. Um, and it's more difficult to help them because you don't know what the right solution strategy might be. You don't know uh, what common problems they might encounter. Uh, if you if you spend the time uh, saying, okay, these are the five problems that they're going to work on, and even if you don't write the solution, if, if the professor provides you the solution, um, just seeing that solution and having that already embedded in your brain is going to start you off in, a, in a, a better starting point because you're going to say, okay, I have an idea of how you might solve it. And as you know, that's not the only solution, right? You're going to see some very creative solutions. Uh, which, which can be difficult to solve when in your mind is this professor's solution and the student's solution doesn't look, is this going to work? Is this really going to work? And, but at least you know <laughs> that there is a solution uh, <laughs> and the strategy they might do. So if they, if they take the creative but it's not going to work solution, you can help try to redirect it or morph it some way to the better solution. But if you don't know that that is the creative solution, it might take you longer than necessary to figure out that they're heading down the wrong path as well. So I want to encourage you to become prepared to, to the lab session ahead of time so that, um, so that you can be ready to go uh, when, when, the, when the students are ready to go. Joseph Vanderhurst um, won the Department of Service Award last spring for this level of TA, right? He was always ready. It was kind of annoying sometimes, though, because, like, he'd say, well, 
I saw you assign this problem and I tried working through it myself and there's a typo here that means you can't actually solve it. And he's like, oh, crap. I'm, I'm glad I have him to, to, to do that. But he like sort of tested the problems in advance before going to the lab mm -hmm. by actually doing them himself, which was super helpful for everybody, right? So for me to tune up those problems to eliminate that beauty, but also made him super effective as a, as a TA in the lab. Are there any questions that are running through your mind uh, about anything we've said up to this point? Yes, Julie. So I'm not actually taking a 120 lab this semester, but I know that, like, when there are lots of students in the lab and you might only have one or two TAs, going through things like this can take a super long time. So what should TAs do when they're working with one student, but they've got 10 students with their hands in the air. I know in the past, if they all had similar questions, uh, I don't know, did we do this last year? Sometimes if there's lots of questions like about the same thing, we'll kind of get off the whiteboard and try to ask the questions to the class as a whole. Is there, like, is that a good approach? Or, like, what should you do if you're, like, you have all these questions going on? I think, yeah, I mean, if, if, if many students have questions about the same problem, um, just sort of announce that, right? We're going to be talking about problem number two over here for a while. If you're stuck on that problem or haven't started yet or, you know, want some suggestions, come over and join us, and that will help kind of parallelize your effort, yeah. I, I think, um, I was just noticing that there's some diagrams up on the board here. Um, learning how to draw a picture of a problem is a super helpful skill, um, and I feel like in some ways, in computer science, you do a good enough job of having kind of a standardized set of pictures and, and a little diagram things. Um, but for students who are visual learners, right, drawing a picture can be the difference between I'm totally confused and oh yeah, I get it, and now I can go write the code with that picture in mind. Um, I, I tend to do that when I'm designing a new piece of software, right, a class diagram, a sequence diagram, an entity relationship diagram, something to just sort of center my thinking on how the thing should be structured. Um, so what you said about you know going to the whiteboard, I think is really super helpful, especially for students who uh, kind of have that propensity toward visual learning. I think your question is, is super difficult. Um, and it, it's the problem that a lot of instructors deal with, regardless of TAs or, or doing that themselves. Um, I've heard of one instructor who um, always does the question and answer session with whatever a student is, they're doing with an iPad and they record the video, uh, the, the recorded audio that's going on between the students as well as everything he's writing on the iPad and he immediately posts it to a class resource page. So because there's nothing secretive about the discussion that's going on the between um, him and, and his students. And so then, if he has another student with the same issue, he has already recorded, oh yeah, I was working with, with Joey on that. Um, go download my conversation with him. And, and he's got all these scripts, so literally, as soon as he presses the stop button on his iPad, it's automatically loading. So he can do that in the same lab session uh, with his students. I know you don't have that functionality and stuff. I'm, I'm just trying to acknowledge that that is a difficult question. Um, but, and so the best solution without that kind of a technological solution, I think is exactly what you do, try to get the, the group of students who are struggling with that same question together, um, almost like a, a little mini tutoring session. Um, the nice thing about that is they see that they're not the only one. Right, they, they see that they're, they're not the only one struggling, and you're going to be more likely to get uh, kind of like uh, a popcorn set of questions, like, oh, well, they're here too, and they're asking questions, and oh, me, but what about this? And it becomes a really lively, interactive session with you between the students. So uh, it can seem frustrating that so many people's hands are, are up but it can turn into a positive situation from, from that regard. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's frustrating for me. I just, like, I feel bad if I'm focusing on one student for, like, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and I know that there's a lot of people that have questions and might be stuck on something yeah. else even. Exactly. So it's like, when do you leave them to suffer for a little bit, and then come, maybe come back, or do you sit, do you yeah. sit there and, like, 
make so, sure they so get through it. I mean, I understand you're, you're being you know, humorous about that, but don't worry about that, right? If, 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 you can't, kind of the, the main theme here tonight is you can't do it for them, right? That's not your job. It's to move them in the direction of where they can do it themselves. So I, I would say give yourself permission to tell a student, okay, we've, you know, we've talked about this for five minutes. Here's the next step. Work on that for a little while. I'll come back and then go talk to you know, kind of the next student in view. It's a little you know, scattered for you as a TA, but giving the student an opportunity to actually try that out and bump up against their, you know, the next stage of their lack of understanding is actually pretty productive. Um, whereas if you, um, and to, to be honest, I've had students like this, right, where they, uh, they'll come to the office um, and they'll want me to help them on a homework assignment. And, and it feels like they expect me to sit there through the entire process of them solving the question and validating their answers at each step. And when, when, when I recognize that, I kind of push back on it and say, okay, you've got to actually do this. You know, I'm not going to be there to, to hold your hand the whole time. I'm happy to sort of dip in at stages along the way, but at the end, end of the day, it's got to be you that understands how to do that. So don't feel like you have to um, you know, stay there until they solve the problem. Just kind of move them in the direction of solving the problem. And in many cases, you'll be pleasantly surprised that the light comes on and they actually get it. Uh, and, and meanwhile, you've been helping somebody else. Don't be mean about it, right? You know, like, I've had enough of you. <laughs> but, yeah, the other thing you know, is you can, um, that's what I was going to say. But the other thing I was uh, thinking about as you're saying that is um, the students can try to, to help each other. Hey, I'm stuck on this, you're stuck on this. Um, let's, and especially since we're going to have these clusters in the lab, let's ask each other these questions and see if we can help each other get unstuck. If, if they're not unstuck, they're still sitting there doing nothing. So they're at least attempting something productive rather than, you know, sitting here like this, you know, I can't possibly be expected to try anything while I'm waiting for you to get around to, to helping me, right? Yeah. No. um... What about in situations where, uh, like, I know Dr. Denning didn't really care for, in his individual labs that he handed out, he didn't really like it when students would interact with each other, um, especially on the codular level, right? Um, as it were. So it's like, in, in a situation like that, where they've got their hand up, they're stomped, you know, they have nothing to do, like, what, what do you recommend they do in that situation? I, well, I agree, and I think a lot of us uh, have a, a shared... Um, emphasis that we don't want people to be, um, that, that's why we want you to be having the TA, so that we're not accidentally um, seeing the answers from our peers by, by looking at their uh, screens and, and, and struggling to then learn it because it's, the, the, the final answer is already there and the, the path along the way has been sort of revealed to, to them. But um, some, a lot of these questions, especially earlier on, don't require any code to answer. Right. So yeah, you can, can you solve a small example by hand? That's the first. Can you describe the algorithm in words? Right. The, um, there's there's zero code in, in, involved in these questions. So these are legal questions to ask your peers in, in every class in, in the curriculum, regardless of what the standard that the, the particular professor set for uh, collaboration in that class. We're, we start to transgress on academic dishonesty, and then we start cheating when we're working with another student who's just, who, who is a peer, not a TA or a teacher, and, and we become the grade assistant, right? You're just giving somebody else in class the answer. You don't want to do, that's what we want to avoid, right? That's why we want you to come and ask questions of the TA or ask questions of the professor, because all of us in here are taking a different, a different approach to this to say, I don't want to just give them the answer, I want to lead them to understand how to find the answer on their own, uh, as opposed to, you know, I'm just sitting with my buddy and, you know, he got 42, therefore I just put 42 on my paper without thinking about it, right? That's cheating. Interacting with the teaching assistant or the professor, hopefully not you, because right? we're going to be intentional about avoiding uh, just giving them the answer.
pretty mean, I, I, we're running out of time here. Um, we have a lot of international students who are coming to campus with communication issues, um, with uh, cultural differences, um, different uh, kinds of approaches to even being willing to ask questions or to admit that they don't know things. Um, and I think you know, th this is not the time to do like intercultural training, I guess, that, although that might be something that we might think about. But just be aware of that. If, you know, if you're interacting with a student who's not from your native culture, who doesn't speak your first language, give them some extra grace, right? Be patient, try to understand kind of where they're coming from. Um, that's just going to facilitate the process um, of making them, to, to what Dr. Geisler was saying earlier, making them a part of the community um, in, in a real practical way, in a context where they're learning as well. Um, so just you know, be extra aware of that. We do have some procedural things that I should cover real quickly here before we get to 10 o'clock. Um, dealing with time cards. Um, Lyon, Lara wanted me to announce um, how important it is for you to, in a timely manner, uh, fill out and turn in your time cards. Uh, there's two primary reasons for this. Uh, number one is it turns out if you don't fill out your time cards in a timely manner, that I, I don't understand this, I'm not a tax attorney. Something happens with how Taylor treats that late time card differently from a non-time time card, and you get taxed more as a result. So you actually lose money as a result of trying to build up your time over multiple time periods. And I don't know what the cutoff is or anything like that, but if you turn them in when they are due, and I know Lara takes care of that, you don't have to worry about that. That's your, your best um, tax situation. Are those just the things that like TAs must fill this thing out and give it to Laura? Is that what the time card is? Or the time the sheet? No, weekly. No. No. But the weekly. Yeah, the time sheets yeah. and bi weekly. When you go to your student okay. dashboard, go from there to the employee dashboard yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. punch in the time. That makes sense. Oh. Uh, and apparently, should... apparently, some students would like to have a bigger check rather than a bunch of small checks. And so they wait to report their time card. Uh, their time cards in so they kind of built up enough hours. And that's a, that's that ends up costing you more taxes. Okay? Uh, this, the second reason why I do like you to do that is it breaks it really hard for us to have a good estimate of a budget for how much TA is going to cost us. And like, oh look it, we don't have any hours. We can hire some more TAs in the emergency at the end of the semester and whoops the, what happened to the budget, right? So that's not helpful for us for, for planning. So for those two reasons alone, we would really like you to just keep up to date with, with your time sheets and, and fill them out as did, you go. Did Laura say when? I mean, when, when does she want those by? So, I mean, if you, you it's know, by, at she, by that following yeah. Monday, right? It's every two every Mondays. Mondays. So every other Monday, the time sheet is due. And, uh, Apparently, people don't. That's true. It's our whole kids. I just thought you didn't get paid. Monday at the time. Yeah. I, well, I, I do the, the same kind of timesheets when I do consulting for the Center for Scripture Engagement, for example. Uh, and I just have a, I don't, I don't, I don't wait till Monday morning because I'm going to forget. I actually set an alarm every other Sunday evening and that goes off and I just take a few minutes and transfer over the, the hours of the video. I don't always remember, but almost always. <laughs> The other thing is we really want to encourage you guys that when you're working as a TA to actually charge the department. That we don't want you to be working gratis. Uh, we don't think that's really fair of us to be asking you to, or, or you to feel some sort of expectation on you that you should be helping out your friends. Um, and that you're not going to get rewarded for it. We've, we've stamped a seal of TA approval on you, um, and your your peers know that, and that's why they're seeking your help and they're seeking your, your expertise. And so you deserve to get paid for that time that you're helping the students in, in these classes that you're registered as a TA for. So make, make sure that you avail yourself of taking advantage of that time and, and being properly compensated for, for the work that you're you're doing in, in these uh, in these classes. So the minimum wage right worker is worthy of his or her wages. So you know, be sure to do that. Uh, one one uh, idea I have when you're talking about you know prepping before you go to your TA hours, that's billable time, right? If you're spending time preparing to go do the TA, 
include that in your in your efforts, right?